to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ and jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with god and man luke chapter 2 verse number 52 we welcome you today to our study of the gospel of luke we're so glad that you joined us for our study and we hope that you'll get your bible have it handy as we're going to look to the word of god together today as always we want you to know that today's lessons are being brought to you by individual christians and congregations of the church of christ the Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Whether it be on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday for Bible study, you would be an honored guest at any of their services. And friend, if you've got a Bible question, you've been thinking about something in the Bible or salvation, uh, matters related to God or whatever it may be, you'll find people in the Lord's church who would be happy to sit down and open up the Word of God and discuss the Scriptures with you. And so we want to encourage you, check out the Church of Christ in your area. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your journey to know God and His Word better. Won't you visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com? From there, you can access all our uh, lessons in video and audio. We have a, a wide variety of Bible study lessons. We have books on every, we have lessons on every book of the Bible and a wide variety of topics available, available free of charge to you. And so check out, if you would, our website, thegospelofchrist.com. If you'd like to get a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, we make those available to you free of charge. Just go to our website, fill out a media request form. You can locate that on the website menu there, and we'll send that to you free of charge. You can get a digital download immediately, or we can send you a DVD or a CD if you need that. Today, as we're thinking about the book of Luke, I want to kind of put Luke in its proper place in both the New Testament and the various accounts of the gospel in the place in the four accounts of the gospel that we see. The New Testament uniquely breaks down into four categories. We have first the gospel accounts, and that is the account of Jesus' life, his birth, his life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And so the first category tells us about who Jesus is, what he did, what he taught, and ultimately his death and resurrection. Second category is the book of Acts. This is about the growth and uh, prosperity of the Lord's church. And so Acts tells us, now that you've learned about Jesus, here's what you've got to do to become a Christian. Here's what people who became Christians, members of the church did, and it serves as a history book for the rest of the letters in the New Testament. Then the third category is Romans through Jude. And that's all about Christian living. We've learned about Christ, We've learned how to become a Christian. Now we're learning about Christian living in Romans through Jude. What did Christians face? How did they deal with matters that related to daily life? What problems arose that needed to be addressed? And then the fourth category, the final category is how to die victoriously in Jesus. Christians are suffering in the book of Revelation. And the message is if you overcome Jesus, in essence, says, you can come over and live with me. Now let's backtrack to that first category, the gospel accounts. Inside this category, there are four accounts of the one gospel, and they each give a little different emphasis, maybe, if you would. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we refer to as the synoptic gospels. That is, they kind of take a, a, a snapshot of Jesus' life, mostly in chronological form, from his birth all the way to the resurrection, and kind of give a synopsis of what Jesus did, what he said, and what he taught. 
John is different in that it is not a synoptic gospel. It is what we refer to as a didactic gospel. That is, it's a teaching gospel. John is not concerned about chronology. He's not concerned necessarily about getting things in the right order. John takes a proposition. Jesus is the Son of God, He's divine, and He handpicks miracles, teachings, sayings, and events that will all prove that proposition. Now, inside Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospels, or gospel accounts, as we said, each of these kind of gives a little different emphasis and flavor with likely a different background people that the writer is addressing. Matthew is a Jew. He's writing to the Jews about the kingdom of heaven and Jesus as the king of that kingdom. And so Matthew's whole approach is to go to the Old Testament Scripture. And he will multiple times refer to the Old Testament Scripture to prove Jesus is the king of this heavenly kingdom and that he is the fulfillment of all prophecy. Mark is unique in that in the Gospel of Mark, Mark likely being written to a Roman audience, um, Mark addresses less of what Jesus said and more of what he did. We refer to Mark as a gospel of action. The Romans were a military-minded people. They wanted to see it happen. They wanted to be on the front line of that. And the key word in the gospel of Mark is straightway or immediately. Jesus did this, and then immediately he would do this as well. And so Mark is a gospel of action written to the Romans. Luke is unique in that Luke addresses the ideal person. Luke likely is written to the Greek-minded people, to the Greeks of that day, and the Greeks had this idea about who the ideal person was. He would be perfect intellectually. He would be perfect physically, a perfect physical specimen. He would be perfect socially, and, and in their mind, that kind of made up the perfect individual. And yet Luke adds a fourth dimension to the ideal person that the Greeks left out. Listen to Luke chapter 2, verse 52 again. Jesus increased in wisdom. There's the perfect individual intellectually. He increased in stature. There's the perfect specimen, human specimen physically. And Jesus increased in favor with God and man. They got that Jesus not only fulfilled that social aspect, perfect socially, but that fourth category they left out, Jesus fulfills spiritually. Jesus is the complete or the total man. And so this is what the Gospel of Luke is all about, showing Jesus as the ideal person to appeal to the Greek mind, draw them in, and teach them about the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Now I want you to begin with me in Luke chapter 1, and what we're going to do in this series of lessons on the Gospel of Luke, we're going to divide the Gospel of Luke into four different lessons, and we're going to take each of these chapters, and we're going to talk about some major ideas, proving Jesus as the ideal person, the Son of God. But notice how Luke begins with this purpose in mind, Luke chapter 1. Look in verses 1 through 4 with me. Here's what Luke says about his account, giving this account under the Holy Spirit of the gospel. Luke says in Luke 1 verse 1, "...inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theopolis, that you may know the certain of those things which you were instructed. And so Luke basically says, there's a lot of people who made a lot of books. There's a lot of people who even told the narrative of Jesus. But he said, I've had perfect understanding. I was there from the beginning. We also recognize that Luke being inspired by the Holy Spirit, had that perfect narrative, and he wrote to an individual named Theophilus. We don't know a lot about Theophilus, but here's what we do know. The name Theophilus is a compound term with the word Theos, God, and Philos, one who loves. And so we're talking about 
a lover of God. Anybody who loves God and has a heart for God, Luke's message would apply to showing the certainty of the things in which we believe. This book is designed to confirm our faith in Jesus, that He is the ideal person, He's the Son of God, and He's the Savior of the world. And so as I study the Gospel of Luke, it brings great faith. It increases my faith, helps my faith to grow in what I've heard and what I've learned about Jesus, and helps me to have a sense of assurance, certainty in the things in which we have heard. And friends, assurance is such a great thing. In a world that's filled with a lot of doubt, it's good to have certainty based on this inspired account of the gospel. And so Luke chapter 1, as many of the synoptic, as Matthew, Mark, and Luke kind of give us keys into this, Luke begins with the ministry of John. John was the one who came to prepare the way for the Messiah. And when you think about all the good that John the Immerser or John the Baptist did, John had a head start because of his parents. Listen to this teaching in Luke chapter 1, verse number 6. Of John's parents it is said, And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. Why did John have such great success in the things he did? What made him such a, a great man of God that he was? John had a head start because his parents were good, godly parents. Listen to this. They were both righteous. What's that mean? That doesn't mean that they never sinned, but they were both trying every day to walk in the light and live according to God's teachings. What's that mean? Walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. When John saw a model in his parents of what it means to follow God, he saw a good model. He saw a good example, and he knew from their example what it was like to be good Christian parents, good follow or good parents, godly parents, and good followers of Almighty God. And then we begin by being introduced to Jesus as the son of David and the fulfillment of prophecy. Look in Luke chapter 1. This is such a powerful passage about Jesus as the fulfillment of the promises that were made to David. Look at Luke chapter 1, verse 32 and 33. At the announcement of Jesus' birth to Mary, the angel says this, He will be great and we be called, will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end all the way back to 2nd Samuel chapter 7 verses 12 through 14 God made a promise to David of your seed someone of your seed is going to reign on the throne of God forever and his kingdom would never end that's a it, it kind of an eternal idea and so the Jews had been looking for that person who was that seed of David taking us back to Genesis where we've got the promise to Abraham, the promise to Isaac, the promise to Jacob, that promise continued about the seed who was going to bless all nations through David. And, and listen to what the angel says to Mary. Oh, he's of the house of David. He'll reign on the throne of David forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. What do we know about this ideal person, Jesus Christ? He is the fulfillment of the seed promise. And to your seed, who is Christ? Galatians chapter 3, about verses 10 through 18. He is the one who fulfilled that promise to David that he would have a one reign on his throne forever. Jesus truly is still reigning at the right hand of God in heaven. Hebrews 1 verse 4. He is still King of kings and Lord of lords, and every prophecy that was made, He's the complete fulfillment of that. His kingdom today is His church. Matthew 16 verse 18 and 19. Jesus said to Peter, And I say to you that you're Peter, and on this rock, the bedrock foundation, that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. On this rock, I will build my church. And then he said to Peter, I'm going to give to you the keys of the kingdom. What's the kingdom? The church that he just spoke about is the kingdom. And we have a privilege with Jesus as the head of that kingdom 
Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23. We have a privilege to be in God's kingdom today and to be members of His church. And so Jesus, as the ideal person, perfectly fulfilled every prophecy. But you know, as we thought about, as in Luke chapter 1, they begin to hear more about this son, this one who's going to come, the, the child of Mary. Here's what's said in Luke chapter 1, verse 66 about this child. The Bible records these words for us. And all those who heard them kept them in their hearts saying, What kind of child will this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. You know, when we think about John and the good work that he did, we think about Jesus and the good work that he did. The people were expecting that. They were looking forward to that. And God's hand. The power of God was continually with these two men. As John prepared the way and as Jesus brought the kingdom into fruition and the many good things that he did, friend, that was what it was all about. They, they, they were expecting that and they saw that and what a great joy that was for them. But what is it Jesus ultimately did? Look in your Bible in Luke chapter 1, and I want you to notice what the Scripture says in verse 79. Here's what He was ultimately going to do. To give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. What did Christ come into the world for? To bring light into a world filled with darkness. In the Bible, the darkness often represents evil and sin and that which is associated with Satan. John chapter 3 verses 14 through 19. Light represents good. It represents God. It represents Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. John 8 verse 12. Christians are encouraged to walk in the light, walk in good and walk in what's right. 1 John 1 verse 7. And so Jesus came to bring light into a, a, a world filled with darkness. He came to bring hope to those who were sitting in, in, in the depths of despair, to those who were in the shadow of death. It looked like death was hovering over them and there was no hope. Jesus came to guide our feet into the way of peace. Friend, I want you to just stop and think about where would the world be? What a dark, dismal, self-centered world this would be if there were no hope. The hope of Christianity, the hope of light in a world filled with darkness, the hope of eternal life when we see death on every hand, the hope of peace when there's so much fighting and despair. That's what Christianity, that's what the ideal person, Jesus Christ, brings into the world. This is why in Luke chapter 2, verse 14, at the birth of Jesus, the angel said, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. You know, as we have just thought about the holiday season, and a lot of people are thinking about uh, Christmas, and a lot of people are thinking about Jesus and His birth and things like that, here's what they said at the birth of Jesus, ultimately, all glory went to God and there were benefits to men, peace and goodwill toward men. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Isaiah 7 verse 14, He made peace through the blood, uh, uh, through the cross and the blood that was shed. Colossians 2 verse 14 and 15, And I received the benefits of that peace in that I'm no longer separated from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, I now have a relationship with God as my Father in the family of God. Ephesians 2 verses 14 through 16. And so Luke presents to us Jesus as the peace giver, the one who made peace possible upon this earth. But I want you to notice what Jesus' mission was. While Jesus was here, what was his mind on? What was his focus on? What, what, what was his ultimate goal? Look in Luke chapter 2, and I want you to see what Jesus says. And here's the context. Jesus' parents, at the tender age, uh, at a young age, Jesus and his family had to go register for the census, traveling back. They, Jesus got separated from his family. They ultimately, eventually will find him a few days later, and he's in the temple teaching. And so it's as though they 
they kind of scold him and say, you know, your mother was worried crazy about you in essence. Don't you know that you've got everything kind of turned upside down with what you did? And look at what Jesus says in Luke 2. Notice verse number 49. The scripture records these words. And he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know I must be about my father's business? When Jesus went into the temple to teach and, and was focused on that and focused on helping people know the will of God. And they said, hey, we've been worried really upset about you. You left us. We don't know what happened. And Jesus said, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? That reminds us of the single-minded focus Jesus had. He came not to do his own will, but the will of him who sent him. John chapter 7, verse 17, Matthew chapter 26, verses 30 through 39. Jesus was all about making sure God's will was done, that he lived that type of life, that he perfectly taught the will of God, that he offered himself as a perfect sacrifice so that man could have the hope of heaven. It wasn't about having fun. It wasn't about his own interest. Jesus was about the Father's business. Friend, I want you to stop and think about this with me for just a moment. My life and yours... When I become a child of God, what's my life need to be about? Seeking first the kingdom, Matthew 6, about doing God's will, John chapter 14, verse number 15, about dying daily, 1 Corinthians 15, 31, taking up my cross and following Jesus, Luke chapter 9, verse 23. As a child of God, my focus needs to first and foremost be on doing the will of God, being about the Father's business, living a good Christian life, doing good in our communities, helping men and women get to heaven. That's the mission of God for every Christian. And of course, because of that, Luke 2.52 records, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Jesus became the ideal person because he had the right focus. If I'm going to be the type of person God wants me to be, I've got to have the right focus as well. And friend, the reason that focus was so important is because Jesus wanted all men to be saved. Hear me well today. Regardless of race, regardless of gender, regardless of social status, regardless of who your parents were, God wants all men to be saved. First Timothy 2 verse 4, God doesn't want anybody to be lost. Second Peter 3 verse 9, and listen to what the Bible says in Luke chapter 3 verse 6. The Word of God records this, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Whether that flesh be Jewish or Gentile, regardless of skin color, regardless of race, regardless of gender, all flesh. God wants everybody to have the opportunity to be saved. Now, friend, that doesn't mean God's going to force or God's going to make anybody, but that's what God wants. That's why Jesus came here. God is not prejudice. God is not bias. Jesus was not that way. God wants everybody. The Spirit and the bride say, come. Let whosoever will come and drink freely. Revelation 22, verses uh, 3 through 10. And so God wants everybody to hear the message of salvation and be saved. And friend, that's what we want as well at the gospel of Christ. In Luke chapter 3, certain people came out to be baptized by John. Everybody's doing it, but the religious elite come out because everybody's doing it, looks like. And John scolds them. In Luke chapter 3, about verses 3 through 9, John says, in essence, to the Jews, the religious elite that came out, you brood of vipers, you bunch of snakes, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. And then John records these words, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. You know, since all salvation or all flesh shall see the salvation of God, John wanted men and women to know there's things you got to do to be saved and be right with God. And friend, we want that message as well, to be clearly heard. In the New Testament, the Bible teaches that to be saved, a person must hear God's message of salvation. Faith 
comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If an individual is going to see the salvation of God that is available for all men, he's got to listen to what God says in His Word. Today, if you'll hear His voice, do not harden your heart. Psalm 95, verse number 7. Men and women must also believe Jesus is the Savior of the world. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. If you don't believe in Jesus, you can't be saved. John chapter 8, verse number 24. Like John taught and like Jesus taught, men, men must turn from a life of sin. Luke 3, verse 8. Luke 13, verse 3 and verse 5. Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. And so I've got to turn from a, a life of wrong and a life of sin and turn to God and try my best every day to live a good life. A person must also, the Bible teaches, make the good confession, Jesus is the Son of God and Savior of the world. Romans 10 verse 10 says, with the heart, with the mind, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Like the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, Men and women must verbally say, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then, friend, to be saved, for all flesh to see the salvation of God, the Bible teaches men and women must be immersed in water for the forgiveness of their sins. Let's make it as plain as we know how. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Peter said, Baptism does now also save us. 1 Peter 3.21 Paul taught that baptism is where we contact the death, the blood, and the burial of Jesus Christ. Romans 6, 1 through 4. And on that first gospel sermon, Acts 2, verse 38, Peter said, Repent and be baptized every one of you for the forgiveness of your sins. And so, friend, as we thought initially about Jesus as the ideal person and the peace and joy and salvation He brings... We want to ask you today, is that, is that yours? Do you have that hope? If not, won't you obey the gospel? If as a child of God, maybe you've got off track, get back right with God. You'll never find more joy and happiness than living for Christ. Join us next time as we study more about Jesus. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.